totally. <laughs> Should I start? Yeah. Uh, well, I guess it's a part of. It was always a part of a Navi strategy. We had uh, players that played for Navi for almost ten years. It was Zeus. It was Edward. Uh, we had similar cases in Dota 2, Dendi, for example. And I think it's crucial and important to be loyal to your players. They will be loyal as well. Uh, and the other thing that, of course, we, we are investing a lot in terms of their personal media development, etc. So for us, it's also, I guess, effective to, to keep uh, players as long as possible and as long as their performance is up to our standards. Well, I think that's the tricky part, is the performance part. Ideally, I think no one would ever make roster changes. It's pretty mm. expensive to do that. Uh, and like you said, fans usually take a liking to the same roster, at least a couple of guys being the same that they build around. The problem is that when it, the team doesn't perform, which is a problem that you out of this group haven't, haven't had since you, <laughs> since you basically got into, uh, got into the game, mm. but we can speak to for, for the more, you know, that's when it gets trickier to decide when's the right time or who to change. Uh, obviously, like M as, as MIDR, we've had the same core the whole time, so that, that hasn't changed, but we've had pretty significant changes outside of the main core of the couple guys. And you tried to get a couple more guys from CIS region? Yeah. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard the rumors that, yeah. uh, that there was a little bit of uh, back and forth. I think, I think you know, seen, seen, seen from my perspective, I totally agree on, you know, the loyalty, investing into them. It's, it's also, I mean, the only time that we made changes was if the culture, the changes that, that, you know, we made very early on, if they were not accepted by, you know, one party. Um, you know, I think a little bit infamously, uh, actually, I don't know how public that actually is, but there was a there was a there was an entire uh, match where our in-game leader decided not to talk. Um, this makes it sort of difficult to adhere to the principles of of communication and 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 changing that culture, and and that was really the the that's that was the point at which we needed to make that change if. If, if the path forward that, that we were taking, uh, the culture, the, the old culture that we wanted to break down and the new culture that we wanted to bring up, that that was changed. I mean, mind you, in August of 2016, when we first started working with Astralis, they were, what, number 13, 14, 15 in the world, uh, having difficulties winning tournaments, getting beyond quarterfinals, semifinals. Uh, and, and what I walked into was definitely not a, you know, was not a culture, was not an attitude uh, that I in any way could, could stand behind. So in making those changes, though, the, the, the players also had to obviously get behind that. And, and thus we're also, the, the, the only two times that we've had to make changes, we've been super mindful of the people then coming into the roster. Yeah, I think, it, I think Denmark probably is actually one of the better countries where, because there is a much bigger scene, I think, beyond just the top level. Um, and you're kind of right in the smack center of Europe, which means that everybody in the lower levels also gets to play the same online qualifiers, all the you know qualifying tournaments and take part in all the lower level play, that there's usually a pretty good pipeline of at least promising players mm. uh, that are around versus, <clears throat> I guess CIS is the same. We're in a little trickier spot in that our actual core region is somewhat removed from the rest of the world. so. There's very little visibility to everything that goes on there. Basically, everybody who turns out to be relatively good or promising in Counter Strike tends to move out of Brazil. Um, and because of the way the because of the way the Brazilian ecosystem currently works, it it almost at times feels like the whole Brazilian scene is really just a theater system for us. And like it's all just really set up so that we would pay buyouts and buy players from there. And like that's basically the premise under which most of the scene operates. So I think that's a that's a bit tough sometimes for us specifically. But you know, so, so you guys have been making a lot, uh, a couple of, of changes here in the past what year and a half. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's what's really the? And sometimes it seems motivated by the player. Sometimes it seems motivated by you. What's the? Uh, I don't meddle. No, not you, but but, <laughs> MIBR, at least from what we could see publicly in, with, with, uh, with Cold Zero, it was more his choice than it was yep. the team's choice, right? No, it was him specifically who said he, he wanted to get out. Um, I think some of the things in the team at that point had gotten a little toxic in like how people were. I think people had different expectations from when they, put, when they went back to a full Brazilian roster. Obviously, mm. I think they 
they sometimes themselves forgot how good they actually were at the end of last year. I mean, for for like all the finals losses, they were the only team I think who won a best of three against your guys uh, in the couple months stretch when you were winning everything, and they got a bunch mm -hmm. of top twos, top threes. Stable at but, least, yeah. But because it was so frustrating to always lose in a in a close fashion, to them it felt like they were just the worst team, and they could never get over the hump. Uh, and that made but that's it because trickier. their expectations were up well, here. Exactly. Their expectations were on 2017 yes, levels, right? But, yes, but the expectations did not necessarily reset as we went back to a full, full Brazilian roster. Um, yeah. And I mean, obviously, they did well at the first major this year. They got top four. They played a reasonably good game against you in, the, in one of the maps um, in, the, in the semifinals. It's after that when they had that, that weird China tournament where they lost to Windigo. That things started going a little south, and I think like couple months, couple months down the line from there, when things were not really progressing and they weren't making, weren't really getting better, I think is when things started clashing. So mm -hmm. that was sort of, to some extent, like out of your hands. Like, sure, you could try to, you know, force trying to fix it and like make it work, but particularly in our case, like these guys are, these guys are in LA like two months a year at most. Like they're virtually never there, so it's not even like something where because you go of to the same because office. of tournaments. Yeah, because of travel. Um, so it's not even something where, you know, you can kind of be around them and like see how things go and like talk to people. It's kind of more removed. So I think I think to some extent the fact that they, in some ways, have more control is almost a necessity just because of how the team happens to work with location. There is not much we can do if it's forced by players, initiated by players. Well, unless, unless, unless you could, you, you know, sure, the, the point when you've gotten to, when, when you've gotten to the point that somebody wants to leave, it's sort of like an employee. If that yeah, employee you, need, you, you need to fix it, try, you need to fix it sooner. You can't fix it, yeah, exactly, yeah. But, but there might be some root causes before mm -hmm. that, right? You know, yeah, which no, you is, just need to get to it sooner, but if you yeah. can't, then at some point you can't really walk back. So I think the point at which it definitely, you know, twice felt right for Astralis in doing both the, the changes we did, one was, you know, Kerrigan being, being benched and, and, and ultimately sold uh, to FaZe uh, and bringing in Glaive, it, uh, it felt right very quickly. And I think one of the, the reasons we, it, it did feel right uh, right away was the fact that that we you know we we certainly had um, Lucas in our glaive in in our um, uh, in our sights, uh, but we also were very very meticulous about um, whether he would actually fit in from a from a chemistry uh, perspective. So I'm a little bit curious about you guys in 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 getting you know what's what's the process from from your side in in bringing in, in the decision making. You mean yeah, and decision making in in figuring out whether this is the right fit, you know, for for the current lineup. Uh, you know, you just brought in a young Argentine who obviously has the potential uh, if you look at the raw stats. But you know, also from from you know about treating some of these root causes. Well, so I mean, for for one, for us, one big thing about this was for the past almost six months now, it's kind of felt like our roster was on like a stopgap solution. We actually never fully signed Lucas. We were pretty open about it since, the, since day one. We said that he was on a loan uh, since the day that he joined the team. Obviously, Luminosity folded in the meantime, so we signed him to a deal. But um, unless things just started clicking really well, we always thought that he was going to be, he was going to get us over the next couple of months, and then we'd, we'd see what okay. to do. Um, so we never thought that he was going to be a long-term solution most likely I mean, hope, obviously we were hoping that things would click and and that would work but we were kind of looking for looking for a potential replacement um part of it is obviously like one look cold was obviously like the highest profile player i think together with fallen uh, but he was also one of the younger players on our team so that's actually the i'm less concerned about the the difference in skill from replacing him but more concerned actually about the fact that you know fur and fallen are like 28 Cold is much younger, so he has many more years left on, on his playing career. So one, I think we just needed to get younger. Um, I think we needed, needed some people who still have like years and years and years left. The other piece was, again, like these guys, I think they're all very driven, actually, despite their age. But like it still does help to have some younger kid, you know, the guy who wakes up early and plays two extra hours of deathmatch because he's just like dying to get there for the first time. He's not thinking about like how to win my third major. He's thinking about how do I get to a major which is just a very, very different, you know, motivation set. So I think for us, like when they started talking, talking about some of these younger guys, like we were very, very encouraged. And it was something that we actually on an organizational side, we're hoping that we would, over, would have already done earlier this year. 
uh, to go for some of these younger players. Because then, yeah, you might not get the results very quickly. But by the way, I mean, they're not guaranteed. And if you pick a more experienced player, you still might not get, the, not get the results. But in that case, you're also not developing anybody. So you're not getting that potential upside there either. So it's more about motivation, not the age, basically. But Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, look, our guys, they live away from home all year. They go back to Brazil like two, three weeks a year, even mm -hmm. in even in LA, um, they're not really home and they're on the road like eight months of the year. So for them, I think it's pretty clear that they want to play. Um, I don't doubt their motivation at all. I think it's more about just getting, you know, a fresh, fresh look at the game and just getting someone who, you know, views things differently. I think it's infectious to have, you know, younger players on your team. At least that's how I felt when, you know, ages yeah, ago I when I played. You have someone newer and it's just like, it kind of takes you back in some ways, I think. I feel the same way and we are doing the same uh, steps uh, in order to, to have younger players. Uh, last couple of years we made three changes. Uh, we bought Electronic, who was 19 that time or 18 even. Um, why we made those changes, uh, as you may remember in 2016, we said goodbye to our IGL, so Zeus. Um, we had a good uh, year in terms of performance, we were, but we were always second, like tournament by tournament, and uh, we couldn't do nothing to, to change it somehow. So and, and at the time, it didn't seem like you needed an in-game leader because it was only after, right after you made the change that Valve changed the rules and Starix <laughs> exactly. could no longer effectively be the in-game leader. I, I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah. So, <laughs> Pretty significant. So by making this decision, we were yeah. quite sure that we were doing the right thing. Then they've changed the rule. Our coach became basically useless. Uh, I mean, uh, in-game. Mm -hmm. um, so we tried to play without. IGL, we were not successful at all. Uh, then we brought Zeus back and then we bought Electronic and I think it was a super nice move in terms of the firepower, his talent, skills, etc. And right after he joined, we had a streak of, I don't remember, maybe 10 tournaments. Uh, we managed to get to playoffs uh, every tournament we played. Then, in the end of uh, last year, of course, we, we have clear understanding that we have two veterans, basically, and their contract uh, will expire soon. Mm, so we had to do some moves in order to, to have uh, plan B. And that is why we bought uh, uh, our current young IGL, Boomage. So we wanted uh, Zeus to share his expertise, his experience. That is why we had to replace Edward, due to maybe poor performance, due to uh, necessity of adding IGL before Zeus is going to leave. I think actually the bigger, I think maybe at least in my opinion, looking from the outside, maybe the bigger change in your case was when, like when do you think the team became sort of Simple's team instead of whoever was the, you know, sort of the guy behind the team, I guess it might have been Zeus or Guardian before that? Because that was really, I think, the change in, at least from the outside in the team. Because like, once it's, if it's the old guys sort of running the show, it's different. So like, you know, right now, if you look at our team, you probably say it's Fallen's team, because it's always been Fallen's team. You know, if, if in a year, Mayern becomes, you know, like a superstar similar to what happened to Cold Zera, maybe you then start thinking in another way. And like at some point, usually when that happens, the younger player starts to have more control. I think from the outside, if you start looking at the kind of results you guys got as soon as Simple joins, obviously one of the all time great players. From the outside, you kind of have to back Simple at that point. Not to say that there is like a conflict in, internally, but like that's kind of, that's how I kind of think of it as like, it's always someone's team to some, to I some don't, extent. It, so, Curious from the outside, wh who, who's, whose team would you say Astralis is? I think it's Device's team. You think so? I think so. Okay. I think it's Sonic's team. It could be. I mean, I, I don't know. Well, I guess I, to some extent, no, no, from but, our it's, but it's interesting. But I mean, it's a super interesting, it's a super interesting perspective. I mean, I mean, I mean my, my view is that if, um, and again, like this is not, doesn't seem to be the culture um, in your team or even in Denmark more specifically. But my sense is like, if there's a conflict in the team, like who's gonna be the player who's gonna decide like what actually happens? And I think he's the, he's the least replaceable, put it that way. 
That might that that, that might very well be. And of um, course, and that player, by the way, always isn't the most vocal player, the one who no, actually no, no, ends no, up no, deciding. No. But like to some extent, like you look to him, even if he's not the one deciding. Like the other guys will look to him and see that he's at least fine with whatever is being discussed. Of, of course, and we all understand that he was the best player of the uh, year 2018, and of course, we care a lot. Uh, about what he thinks, etc. However, and he has an ego, a huge ego. Uh, but, <laughs> Sasha, no. <laughs> but uh, when uh, Zeus uh, came back, uh, everything was decided by the coach and uh, uh, team captain. So we didn't have any issues with Sasha. Uh, I mean, decision making wise. Yeah, I mean, it was less about issues in the first place. So the question no, of like but, how, but, you, uh, how you thought about it, less so than like having issues and having to fight back and forth. Uh, it's difficult, but uh, you know, when Sasha joined uh, before Navi, he, he didn't play for any roster more than three months. Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, this summer or early autumn, it's going to be four years with Navi. So, uh, of course, we are trying to work uh, with him, trying to um, to make him a man, <laughs> not a boy. He's, he's done a Kobean effort in changing the public perception about him. Like if you sure. go back four years and think what, like how negatively people thought of Simple uh, and compare to now, it's like Kobe from the early 2000s well, to later well, on. He's still thin, he has some issues in game, but uh, oh, in, in everybody the, does though. In the real life, he's super he's nice, such a super nice guy. Polite, yeah, he person, certainly is. And um, it's a pleasure to work with him. But, but I, I, think, I think actually, I, I don't like this, it's somebody's team, because I think, and I think, I think as, as, a, as a team, really wanting to go against that, because it puts a lot of pressure on them and pressure that you don't want them to necessarily have. It's certainly pressure I don't want Device to have on his shoulders, a weight on his shoulders that he has to think that, that it's up to him to, to, uh, to keep things together, yeah. right? You know, because I just, I need him to perform as best as he can in game, remove as much responsibility from him on, on anything and worries which is out of game, which is, you know, I think actually one of the things which is, which for me was one of the really core things wanting to change, which was this thing that, that you know, when, when we came in, players were thinking way too much about all kinds of stuff which was not at all game related, right? You know, um, uh, I was afraid that Yevin was going to kick me, so I'd start scheming with you about kicking Yevin, you know, all this kind of stuff, you know, which is just like, totally useless uh, um, from from a player's day-to-day -day interactions and, and doesn't make uh, him or her a better player. I think the ideal, ideal scheme is when you have a coach that is able to control everything, including okay. transfer policy, uh, discipline, totally. etc. However, we, we, we all understand that there are lack of... Look, when we came in, Sonic was afraid of being fired by the players, right? It, and it's like, would you, but, but, and that doesn't happen in, in any, that doesn't happen in any other sport, right? You know, well, and, and that, was, that was a significant change in giving him the clear, uncut authority. But that's, a, that's a big part of it, you know? I think, I think many, of the, many of the issues that I think that especially younger players are having these days, I think in some ways struck back to the fact that generally speaking, it seems like all the players who played sports when they were younger and they actually, you know, had to obey a coach. Yeah. They're the ones who de usually tend to do better in a team environment. But then there's people who maybe they only played individual sports or they didn't play sports and they just got really good at games. Like they're not used to someone telling them what to do or like having to listen to. He's earning when you, less, you know, when he, you're, he has less prize when, money. When you're 10 years old and you're playing a sport and you do something dumb and the coach, coach puts you on the bench, there isn't anything you can do. You yeah. just learn that if I want to play, I can't do that again. If I don't show up for yeah. practice on Thursday, I'm going to be on the bench on Sunday. Yeah. But if no one ever teaches you that, you just think mm. that you have the power. Um, I think, I do think you're, point about pressure is interesting. I do think players in general do a bit of a disservice to themselves by hyping things up to be bigger than they are. For example, mm. like people always talk about how the pressure at the majors is so massive. And like, of course, like there's a lot of stuff around it, but by speaking about it constantly, you actually build it up to be an even bigger thing in your head. Yeah. Um, and I think the counterpoint, and you basically alluded to this with the Sonic thing, is that sure, like you have some weight from thinking it's my team, like it kind of dies and lives with me. So like I'm 
I'm the one who has the pressure, but also it's my team. So like whether we do well or not, I'm going to be here. You might get but, but, but I think So like I think it works two ways. I think it depends on person. It's sure, not the same for everybody. But that's that's an individual thing instead of putting the pressure on yourself of getting the entire you know, team to work. You know, I think every single one of of the players on Astralis today feel that they are Astralis and this is theirs and, and, and take immense pride and ownership of it. Uh, it's just on having to focus on, on other stuff, you know, like you know, how's my constellation going to be? What's, you know, what, are, what is my concern about, you know, Zips uh, being sick or, you know, all these, all these type of minor things, which can fill a lot when, you're, when you should just be laser focused on, yeah. on the next match. It's about clubs to find an appropriate person to, to run the exact trust, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah. And over time, I think what Yevon said is right. I think over time, it's going to just become the norm that there will be like a coach figure who's, who's effectively going to be in charge of the team. With, I mean, obviously with some limitations, because I think that's the, that's the ideal solution. But, but you the know, coach, there needs the, to be the like a also, of the guard. Yeah, exactly. But the coaches have also needed education, right? You know, of course. Uh, none, of, none of these guys have had uh, much coaching, uh, haven't had the opportunity to have coaching education. Yeah, and a lot and that's of former players, now. they have a lot of issues with discipline, mm -hmm. uh, exactly. know, time, et cetera, uh, business, uh, attitude. They, they so. just didn't, didn't have previous experience in business, corporate business, whatever. And they're getting that now. Yes. And they're getting the coaching education so and so forth. We, we should wait. Well, last year was awful for us. Blast-wise, we've lost like all uh, tournaments we played. We didn't manage to get to Bahrain finals. Uh, we've lost all games at our home tournament in Moscow. Uh, however, we made a lot of uh, changes, uh, reforms, I would call it. And of course, I am quite optimistic. Uh, I think next year we are going to compete with Astralis, with MIBR, and I, I'm sure that uh, we will be able to even win this game. Uh, serious. Uh, I also uh, like a lot what Blast uh, has changed in terms of the format, as of course it was nice and easy to spend only a couple days in Copenhagen, etc. But uh, mm, competition-wise, it's not something that, uh, that is great for CSGO. I think best of three is much better. Uh, Next year we'll have more tournaments. Uh, we're discussing a lot of different stuff uh, in terms of media cooperation with Blast. So um, only positive feelings, and I think we will we'll do our best. Well, you know, it's funny you you made the point about you not doing well in Moscow. All of us bombed our home tournaments this year. It's true. Um, <laughs> we all underperformed uh, expectations significantly. In Sao Paulo, you in Moscow, and Astralis I, 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 It in feels Copenhagen. awful. It was last tournament of our <laughs> captain and like yeah. zero games won. Yeah, so at least that part <laughs> should be better for all of us than hopefully by playing on neutral ground. Maybe that, uh, maybe that helps. But no, I think, uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of the format of staying in one place for a little bit longer and actually having a more structured thing um, as opposed to this whole, you know, flying to a different city and different part of the world every single weekend. I think it's pretty taxing on the players um, to always have to be on flights, so always have to be adjusting to new time zones. I think that's also going to lead to better quality product from the sense that players will be able to view, you know, feel better, they'll be more prepared, they'll probably be playing better. I think teams will be more prepared. I think the quality of the game will go up. And like Yevon alluded to, you know, the format's just going to be, format's going to most likely allow for better, better Counter-Strike as well. You just play more, so the better teams end up winning all the time. So you end up with the best players playing the most, less playing the biggest finals. Random, yeah. There's going to be less randomness in results. So I, I look forward to that piece in, in particular. Yeah, I think also. I mean, I look forward to beating Liquid every single time next year. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I think I think from a from a from a definitely from a format perspective. Um, I'm also still hoping, you know, for some of these unexpected things. Like, you know, one of my favorite moments. I think everybody's favorite moments from Copenhagen was, you know, uh, Sonic against Simple in, in in the shootout. Right? You know, you get these. 
uh, so, so I think I think we all have to remember the the, the uh, you know to allow ourselves for you know some of these unexpected uh, things and and they create great moments that you know we'll we'll remember for for good uh, period uh, forward. So so hopefully hopefully the the the, the, the format the teams the individuals. Uh, every everyone around uh, Blast uh, will will allow for that and open up for those uh, situations.